Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us for the 2021 Coalition for a Prosperous America Annual Conference. I am excited to get our tax policy uh, panel underway. Moderating today is David Morris, who is the Tax Policy Director for the Coalition for a Prosperous America. Good afternoon, David. How are you? I'm doing fine, Melissa. Thank you for doing all this work. It's very much appreciated. Oh, my pleasure. It's so much fun. You guys are giving me really great content to work with. So appreciate it on that level. Absolutely. And hello and thank you to everybody here for joining the Coalition for a Prosperous America's Reforming Corporate Taxation to help reshore our industries panel. Uh, we start this panel off with a recognition. The Coalition for a Prosperous America's focus on repairing the tax code for domestic companies and manufacturers is due to the insight and support of Mr. Bill Parks of NRS Inc. Bill is a board member of CPA and a tireless worker on behalf of a fair tax system for American companies. As a former professor and a true American business success story, Bill was perfectly suited to bridge the divide between academia and the business communities. He helped us understand tax policy can impact American businesses' ability to compete even in the US and his dedication is an inspiration to us all. Bill, we thank you. Now, due in no small part to Bill's efforts, the Coalition for a Prosperous America is proud to be able to present the pre-recorded remarks of the senior senator of Idaho and ranking member of the Senate Finance Committee, the Honorable Mike Crapo. Senator Crapo was unable to be here in person today, but he wished to offer his perspective on the state of the U.S. tax code and how it affects businesses and how best to reshore jobs in the coming years. Senator Crapo. First, a big thanks to Bill Parks for his thoughtful ideas and continued work to explore solutions for complex business tax issues, including options for a simpler territorial method such as a sales factor apportionment. His input has been very helpful to our efforts to promote and strengthen the use of ESOPs and the concept of employee ownership has really taken hold in Idaho and across our country. I appreciate your question highlighting the issue of global competitiveness of U.S. companies and your concerns about potential advantages held by foreign headquartered companies. Ensuring U.S. companies can compete with their foreign counterparts is a key priority, especially as we begin to rebuild from the COVID-19 pandemic. It was also an important factor that motivated the changes to the international tax system as a part of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. Prior to TCJA, the U.S. corporate tax rate was the highest among economically developed countries. Combined with an outdated international tax system, U.S. companies were incentivized to keep or move operations and profits offshore. There were constant headlines announcing plans for U.S. companies to invert or to make their headquarters overseas to avoid the burdens imposed by the U.S. tax system. TCJA lowered the corporate tax rate to 21% to level the playing field for U.S. businesses. And for those who argue 21% is too low, I would remind them that the U.S. combined statutory rate, taking into account federal and state taxes, is still the 11th highest among developed countries. In addition to providing a more competitive rate, TCJA also sought to end avoidance of tax with provisions to target base erosion and profit shifting. For example, the Base Erosion Anti-Abuse Tax, or what we call BEAT, specifically targets payments made by U.S. subsidiaries to their foreign parents and affiliates. That provision and others make it more difficult for foreign headquartered companies to gain a tax advantage over U.S.-based companies. While we're still in the early stages after TCJA enactment and implementation, we are already seeing encouraging signs from available data. Data from the Bureau of Economic Analysis clearly shows that tax reform stemmed the flood of offshoring while encouraging U.S. companies to invest here. In fact, among U.S. multinationals, Employment, investment, research, and production in the United States has increased at a faster rate in 2018 than the average rate over the past 20 years. At the same time, evidence is mounting that foreign acquisitions of U.S. companies have dropped significantly since tax reform, 
while U.S. acquisitions of foreign companies have been on an upward trend. These are the positive effects we had hoped to see as a result of TCJA, but I know there are always areas for potential improvement. Based on data and feedback from the business community, we should explore whether provisions are working as intended. In the near term, there should be a robust oversight of the TCJA provisions as implemented so we can act, assess the real-world effects. We have an opportunity to strengthen the reforms introduced in TCJA to ensure our tax system is working and gives U.S. companies the best opportunity to compete globally. My concern is that the Biden administration may take us backward, dramatically raising U.S. tax rates on business, domestic, and foreign earnings in a way that places companies once again at a competitive disadvantage. As the new administration begin, begins to develop their business tax framework, it will be especially important that the tax writing committees, both Republicans and Democrats, hear ideas from you all on the practical effect of the proposals and how the rules can be improved. We look forward to working with Bill and the business community to evaluate how we can strengthen and refine policies to meet our shared goal of increasing investment and jobs in the United States and strengthening U.S. competitiveness overseas. Thank you, Senator Crapo, for that presentation. We support your efforts to increase jobs in the United States, and we look forward to your work in that regard. Now, I'd like to present another video. The Honorable Congressman Bill Pascrell was very happy to be invited to this panel, but his schedule required pre-recording. The two of us had a great discussion last week. He insisted that I pass along his greeting to all our members, and I'm happy to present that pre-recording at this time. And now I'd like to introduce the Congressman representing New Jersey's 9th Congressional District, presenting his perspective on what we need to reshore jobs back to the United States through tax policy reform. A friend of the Coalition for a Prosperous America, the Honorable Bill Pascrell. Thank you, Congressman, and welcome. David, thank you. Thanks for inviting me uh, to participate in this conference. And the Coalition uh, for a Prosperous America is a very live and active group and i appreciate your efforts to uh do what we said we're going to do more jobs here in america um i've appreciated your input uh, to our committee's discussions that's the ways and means it's the tax writing committee of the united states on trade and tax policy uh over the years now, I applaud your thoughtful tribute to Bill Parks, and I join in that, David. I want to state from the outset that I am committed with the body and soul to make our tax code fair for ordinary American citizens. I said this on the day I got the job <laughs> as chairman of the Oversight Committee in the Ways and Means. Right now, I firmly believe the United States tax system is heavily tilted. It's tilted towards the interests of the very wealthy and powerful and big corporations. Tax fairness is a titanic task. There are many ways that we could close the inequality that exists. CFA is, is correct that the taxation of multinationals is one avenue that we need to examine to ensure that everyone with a presence in the United States is paying their fair share of taxes. I think that's what we all want. Of course, what some people consider fair and what I consider fair may be two different things. My colleagues on the other side have done everything in their power to increase tax fairness, unfairness, the single largest legislative achievement, if you can call it that, the, the single most largest is the previous administration's drastically reduced the corporate income tax rate from 35 to 21%. This slanted 
an already unfair system even more. There was agreement as way back as eight years ago that we would reduce that system from 35% to about 34% or 33% or even 32%. Never, never was the discussion about 21%. If you go back to the history of 2017, you'll see that was a last minute inclusion just to make the more affluent, more affluent, and the more powerful, more powerful. And when did you ever hear of a party cutting taxes and getting clobbered in the next election? Nobody was fooled. Tax cuts sound great. Who's against them? But when we understand the consequences, or you're allowed to get the point across what they're doing, a point of entry in a point of exit, uh, the the results, then you see what I'm talking about very quickly. At the same time, that tax scam of 2017 made substantial changes to the way our nation taxes the foreign profits of multinationals headquartered on our sh shores. This was done with a claim that it would create jobs and boost foreign investments in the United States of America. The act, as I see it, they've attempted to broaden the tax base by adding a new minimum tax known as the guilty tax, pronounced guilty, except for normal return on tangible asset investments abroad such as factories and equipment. Under this regime, profits of multinationals headquartered here are taxed at 21% or at the minimum tax rate of 10.5%. But the multi-million dollar question is whether this new regime has truly boosted foreign investments at home and actually brought jobs back to the United States as the Republicans swore it would when they jammed their tax cuts through. So what's the verdict? Let's look at the evidence, facts. Something that we need to do in all areas and withstand the truth. That's what this is all about. The evidence is not conclusive, so today, it may be too early to say one way or the other, but we can draw some hard conclusions. One of them is that we are collecting far less corporate revenue than before. I want to repeat that. Because just the opposite impression has been communicated to the American people. They took it out on the, the Republicans' hide in, in twenty. 18 in that election, it was a stark election where they lost a hell of a lot of seats. So we collect far less corporate revenue than we did before. And far less than what the Republicans promised. So no one argued that this was a fair tax system that existed before in that the nation had less revenue to deal with. And if you remember, the biggest slice of that tax cut in 2017 was, in terms of the question of how we're going to pay for this, is why are we cutting the greatest deductible? And that is the salt tax, the state and local taxes. That deduction was the oldest on the books and the code. Went back to the Civil War to protect the states so that they have enough money to build their highways, hospitals, etc. The federal government was taking money because of that war. So the verdict, while not conclusive, is, get, is, is seeing the light of day. We're getting there. In fact, some of them in this believe uh, with very good evidence that the changes imposed by the Republican tax scam law actually 
incentivized multinationals to shift jobs and commerce abroad. That is their law reached the track to make more and more jobs and tax dollars over, put them overseas. Some of our newly appointed treasury officials have written about this phenomenon in this administration. I know Chairman Richie Neal of the Ways and Means Committee is fully committed to continuing to examine and expose the multi-flaws in the 2017 uh, tax revisions. Chairman, I know I've had many discussions with him. Richie Neal is very clear on this. We will hopefully have a series of hearings on that subject alone. So it's coming. I could envision the CFA sales factor apportionment proposal could be discussed in a hearing such as that. So let's be prepared. I'm also committed to moving my legislation, the Bring Jobs Home Act. It would provide a direct incentive for companies to reshore, S-H-O-R-E, their production and their jobs in the United States. Simultaneously, our bill will penalize companies that abandon the U.S. and send jobs and businesses to other countries. I'm delighted that President Biden has made bringing jobs back to America the highest priority. I expect there will be going ongoing high level discussion between the Congress and the president on the best way to do that. You're not solving one problem, creating three others. Finally, I'm very aware that tax laws are not the only and often not even the primary reason for locating in a particular country. Labor and environmental laws can make the difference. That is why I was adamant that NAFTA II needed to contain stronger provisions on both points. I ended up opposing that trade agreement, which had many good things in it. I don't think those provisions are favorable enough to American workers, and I still don't. And the proof is coming in right now, and the reluctance of this administration even to discuss the positive fallouts from NAFTA too. We just had a report several weeks ago about NAFTA too and how it was working. No sense, no indication that we were saving American jobs in the United States of America. None. I could find none. And the vote was, and only 40 of us voted no on it. It wasn't even close. And I was the ranking member that when we were putting much of it together, and then when the, the shift went back to the Democrats, that they would have the majority, uh, there, there was a major effort to find a way to say yes. And we did. And you ask me now a year later, my answer would be even more no. So our ongoing discussions with our trading partners remain crucial in keeping manufacturing and service jobs in the United States. I have supreme confidence that I really do, that the new USTR, Catherine Tay, who was just passed yesterday, 98 to nothing. I called Catherine and I said, what the heck did you do to bribe these Congress people, the senators? She's a fine young lady of character. She knows her stuff. I hope we see some differences. Uh, I think our last trade partner was, was refreshing to me. And I've said that to both Democrat and Republican presidents in the past. I think that we have a real winner here, Catherine Ty. 
Uh, so we have many reasons to feel good that with our nation's current leadership in Congress and the White House, our tax system is slowly moving in the right direction. In fact, right after uh, this presentation, uh, this afternoon, 2 o'clock Eastern Standard Time, and I think it's going to be on C-SPAN, uh, we will have a hearing with the IRS Commission. That should be an interesting hearing. And I'm anxious to get into a lot of questions with them. In fact, he just uh, responded to our request, myself and Richie Neal, about delaying the filing. Uh, we our request was May the seventeenth, but we settled. We settled. Uh, our, no, ours was uh, excuse me, June the seventeenth, and we we settled for May the seventeenth on a Monday. So, uh, I want to I want to say thank you uh, for this opportunity. Shaping the rules, shaping the code which we had not done since 1984. You don't call tax reform what happened in 2017. Then you better get back to the books. <laughs> that was not tax reform whatsoever. There were no witnesses. It was a really terrible way we did this in the name of tax reform. Now we need reform more than ever. And Richie and I have also talked about, the chairman and I have also talked about what was passed in 2017. You notice the difference between the two parties. We didn't come in and say we're going to change everything in what you passed in 2017. There were some things that I think made sense, and we should be able to distinguish between. I look forward to answering a few questions. David, I know you have a question. Thank you. Thank you, Congressman. <clears throat> so my question was, what are your opinions regarding the international tax negotiations at the OECD level, and how could they affect tax reform priorities in the United States? Great question. The negotiations of the OECD that they've undertaken are very important to the United States as we try to assess the changes we need to make in our tax code. If, you, if we don't we would be t very foolish to have a blind eye to how, where they're moving, where those outside taxes are going. First, we want to head off a digital tax war where individual countries uh, adopt digital taxes largely directed against the United States tech companies. Those, com those taxes have resulted in a trade war, pure and simple. Trade wars help no one in the long run. They've been disruptive, and they've been very expensive in our own countries. We just started to settle a few things with the, uh, with the, with the British. How to do that is very complicated, what I just said. The OECD has suggested two pillars for accomplishing a global agreement on taxing individuals. They need to be examined. The first pillar attempts to relocate a portion of the company's digital profits to market jurisdictions. This has given the United States some problems because the definition seemed to target mainly the United States companies. The second pillar is an attempt to get OECD countries to adopt a minimum tax similar to our guilty regime. While our guilty regime may not be perfect, I think it's a pretty good model. It needs to look, be looked at, changed in some ways. The U.S. Treasury negotiators have been seeking a grandfather for our current regime. <clears throat> Global consensus on these issues could necessitate congressional action. I think it, like, it probably will, but it may necessitate them, and we should be able to look at that and, and examine it beforehand. 
So we're paying very close attention to these negotiations. We need to remain at the table to ensure the best income that we could hope for for the United States and our companies. We do not want to cede our tax base to other countries. Our sovereignty is important. I hope that answers your question, David. I appreciate your invitation to share my views on these crucial issues, uh, our current tax code incentives, multinationals, both U.S. and foreign, on where to locate the manufacturing and their jobs. And in fact, the answer to that question, the response to that question, goes back to our very basic question about how we're going to save jobs in America. Dave, it's a pleasure for me to talk with you today. Congressman Pascrell, thank you for making time for us and for your continued efforts on behalf of American workers and businesses. Thank you once again. Please say hello to everybody for me, David. I'd appreciate that. Absolutely. Thank you. Once again, thank you, Congressman Pascrell. Now it is my very great privilege to introduce our first live panelist, the Tax Counsel for the House of Representatives Ways and Means Committee, G. Pritchard. Ms. Pritchard advises the committee on business tax matters with a focus on international taxation. G., it is great to have you here. Thanks for having me and inviting me to participate in this panel. I, I realized that I had to shift to a slightly different uh, computer and I am coming out a little fuzzy, but I'm, I hope it's not a huge problem. Uh, thank you, thank you. Regard, uh, we're just grateful to have you here. So <clears throat> let me jump into uh, my first question for you, which would be, what are the major priorities in tax reform that you foresee coming out of our Congress? Um, before I launch into um, kind of the state of play of things on the Hill, I'm going to take this time to not get myself in trouble, <laughs> saying a very short disclaimer. Um, that everything I say is off the record and that I'm speaking on my own behalf and not on behalf of the committee, the members, or any of our fellow um, staff. Um, you, I think, have asked a um, really timely question. Um, you know, we just, Congress just spent um, a few months really um, committed to passing the American Rescue Plan with the, with the Biden administration and it's, um, and we've gotten a lot of great feedback. And so uh, we're very proud of that work. And we uh, had hoped to get a couple of weeks of break in there, taking things slow, but we have obviously launched into a very uh, busy work on the infrastructure package. Um, and as you know, infrastructure has been a priority on both sides of the aisle for a very, very long time. Um, but I think the way the Biden administration and the Democratic members of Congress are thinking about this is, you know, much broader than roads and bridges, you know, planes and trains and automobiles. I think that um, this is a great opportunity to think about uh, a greener climate. Um, it is a way to think about how we can further community development. Um, we are also looking into various um, bonding incentives to help out the localities and the states. And um, we are, you know, as you know, the House passed that uh, large package last Congress. And so we're going to build up on that. And so you'll see uh, a lot of discussions in the coming months uh, around infrastructure. Um, and think of that as, you know, just a much broader package than just the thing that I, you know, that I outlined in the, in the, in the first instance. Um, I also want to, to outline for you that uh, the Biden administration in the uh, Build Back Better uh, plan has outlined um, some other priorities or additional priorities, and that um, has to do with, uh, you know, some revenue raisers. Um, and I think that if we 
uh, depending on the size and the scope of the package, there may need to be a need to raise revenue. Um, and so we are looking at, you know, a variety of ways to do that. Um, I will also mention that in the recent um, uh, list of executive orders that President Biden issued and signed, um, there is one that deals with supply chain resiliency and, you know, national competitiveness with regard to certain industries. Um, and so I would refer that to you. I mean, I, you know, I would just flag that for you and the audience as something to look at and consider. Um, and there are, uh, there's a desire and, and an appetite I sense from the White House um, of wanting to, you know, provide some incentives in those areas to make manufacturing uh, resiliency, all of that, just like to, to, to really boost that up uh, domestically. And so um, we are keeping a very close eye on that um, and, you know, participating in the conversation. So do note that, you know, that's on the horizon as well. Um, and as you know, I'll th just lastly, I'll mention like lurking in the background are, you know, OECD and, and inclusive framework uh, discussions on pillars one and two. Right. Um, and those will certainly, depending on how the negotiations conclude and how the U.S. comes out um, on that, on those two pillars, may very well require legislative changes in action. Right. And so um, we're looking at the timing of that. Thanks. And uh, so speaking about the reshoring jobs uh, aspect a little more, what concerns might you have about the altering of the tax code and how that affects the reshoring of jobs? Right. So recall that I briefly mentioned the uh, Build Back Better plan. Right. Um, and one of the items, um, I, I, I think of it as a carrot and stick approach, um, is that the Biden campaign at the time, and we look forward to seeing more material on this uh, in the near future, there was a mention of a 10% um, credit for uh, domestic investments in manufacturing, and then there was a penalty for uh, outsourcing. And when I say outsourcing, I think I, you know, I'm really more talking about uh, uh, the round tripping phenomenon where you know, part of the uh, manufacturing might have taken place in the United States. It's, it goes outside the United States for completion and then it's sold back into the US market, that type of thing, uh, which is not uncommon. Um, and so what that ends up doing is that you know, there's, there's some concern that um, you know, jobs and facilities um, are outsourced, um, perhaps to lower tax jurisdictions. And so, um, you know, so that is one thing. And, and I also referred to the executive order that talked about certain enhancements in various industries um, to boost up that industry, those industries and the U.S. competitiveness um, with, you know, respect to other countries. Um, to make sure that we have enough supplies and that we are being competitive and we are being the leaders uh, in those industries. And so, you know, right. we are looking at those two things, but um, but I will say that on the on the incentive side, we do, you know, we do have to think through whether the incentives are provided for behavior that would have already taken place. Um, and then on the penalty side, we have to be mindful of the administrative challenges that might arise. Um, like for instance, the round tripping, you know, the, the tracing of a product through various stages of manufacturing might be difficult. Um, and whether those things ultimately come back to the U.S. market. So I just mentioned that as some of the things that we are looking at and, um, um, you know, right. whether the tax incentives really 
um, and the disincentives ultimately end up influencing where companies decide to locate their activities. And whether it's not something in addition to that, like for instance, I just heard um, Chairman Pasquale talk about you know various trade issues um, that kind of play into where we you know where companies locate their activities and jobs. So I think right. we need to think of that as a as a broader holistic uh, matter, right? Right. And actually, in speaking about that, so guilty was a large part of the previous. Uh, Tax Cut and Jobs Act, it was mentioned uh, a couple times, and re guilty reforms are currently a topic of interest. What direction do you foresee for guilty reform, and uh, do international the international negotiations that you mentioned previously pay play a part in that? Oh, for sure. Um, I will start with the second item. Um, as we talked about um, the OECD discussions, and I think really in talking about guilty, you know, I'm going to refer to pillar two negotiations. Um, you know, there is the GLOBE proposal, which is the blueprint proposal um, that came out of the pillar two negotiations. And it is um, a design that is you know, that has that share some similarities with our guilty regime, but, you know, has some distinctions. Um, and so I think that the, the that, you know, the Trump administration, uh, in, you know, in addition to raising safe harbor requests, had also asked to have the, our, our minimum tax regime grandfathered so that it would suffice. Um, even though, you know, the globe model is really more of a per country calculation. And so you will see uh, discussions in that space, um, the differences and similarities in the model and whether guilty will be grandfathered. Um, obviously, companies and stakeholders will want to, to have guilty regime grandfathered. Um, there are also, I think, those who believe that um, that multinational corporations uh, are are not paying enough in taxes, and so you know the Biden administration you know kind of ran on this uh, on these points that we need to increase the tax rate applicable to guilty. You know we need to do away with. Uh, you know, QBI or what we understand as normal returns on various um, tangible assets of investors abroad. Um, and, uh, you know, obviously that includes increasing the domestic corporate income tax rate. And right. so there are, keep there, I think, I think there are some treasury officials that are, are, are kind of, you know, newly installed treasure, treasury officials who, uh, you know, are like advocating for these changes. Um, I think that, and I will highlight the the Senate Finance Committee hearing on international taxes that's taking place tomorrow. Um, and I would, you know, I, hopefully I can watch that. But the direction, the general direction is that we're going to continue to talk about um, Country by country versus a blending of the of of, of the um, the the determination of of guilty, and I think we're going to continue to talk about um, the role of you know normal returns. We're going to talk also about the appropriateness of the beat and the FBII, all of these things. But I would say that is kind of the general direction of the conversation. Um, I think that the members will have to determine whether these changes are appropriate for the revenues that we need, or whether they believe that it is a matter of fairness. Um, so that is, you know, we need to do our work as staff to kind of um, 
help members understand those issues and those stress points. Right. So, and just with a little bit of time left, I did want to bring up, so there's a requirement for a physical presence to establish a taxing right that's mm -hmm. been long understood, but has been more directly challenged, especially notably in these OECD negotiations that you mentioned uh, under Pillar 1. What effect do you think this might have on U.S. tax reforms regarding foreign multinational tax avoidance? Right. So, um, as a lot of people who work in the tax policy area know, the um, OECD Pillar 1 discussions have presented some challenges, um, in part because the, the, the discussions really push the boundaries of the traditional rules that normally apply to, you know, um, uh, the, the arm's length pricing model that um, companies and their affiliates and their, you know, related um, entities charge each other. Um, but here, I think we're really dealing with um, uh, rules that want to do away with this idea of permanent establishment, which is the requirement for a physical presence in a particular jurisdiction in order for that jurisdiction to have taxing rights over the property. Um, but I think we can't forget the, that there are forces beyond just the tax policy um, the kind of is, you know, more in, about political pressures in these countries to want to uh, require the large digital giants to pay more in taxes into the market jurisdiction. So Pillar 1 um, is a combination of, you know, wanting to do away with some of these um, traditional rules, but also kind of dealing with the political pressures of the time. Um, so here we are in Pillar 1 negotiations, which uh, proposes to reallocate some portion of uh, a profit profits to market jurisdictions. Um, and I know that CPA is particularly interested in, you know, a formulary apportionment of these profits. Um, now, I think what's really interesting is your question really deals with how do how do these how do these issues uh, really affect foreign headquarter companies doing business in the U.S. market? Right. You know, because really the narrative so far, at least in these negotiations, has been that it's the U.S. companies taking advantage of the foreign market. Um, and that, at least in appearance, it'll, it's going to be the U.S. companies working over a certain portion of their profit to EU countries, India, wherever. Um, but, you know, we're not often thinking about it the other way around. Um, and I think that it is really important for Treasury, who is in the room negotiating, to understand that. Um, and so I would encourage uh, <clears throat> you and you know, your members to really make that clear to Treasury that this is not just about a one-way thing. It's really also affecting US companies um, who are competing against you know, foreign headquarter companies exploiting the US market. Um, so, you know, that's what I would encourage. And I think that that really the Pillar 1 negotiations is kind of the prime um, forum right now for these discussions to happen. Um, because ideally, you know, one country going alone doesn't work very well when it's, it's you know, global companies uh, kind of doing cross-border activities. Mm -hmm. Got it. Well, <clears throat> uh, G, I once again, I wanted to thank you for coming on. I know 
this was uh, quite a, a wonderful commitment that you made on our part. It's been a pleasure. Uh, we do hope to see more work on efforts to reshore jobs in the U.S. and uh, hope to continue just being able to work with your offices and explain our position. So thank you. It's been my pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. Once again, that's a, a thank you to uh, G. Pritchard. Now, now I would like to introduce the Irwin I. Cohn Professor of Law and Director of the International Tax LLM Program of Michigan Law at the University of Michigan, Professor Reuven Aviona. Professor Aviona specializes in corporate and international taxation. He has previously served as a consultant to the U.S. Department of the Treasury and the OECD on tax competition. He is also a member of the steering group for OECD's International Network for Tax Research. Reuven, it's great that you could join us. Thank you very much for having me. I, you know, I, I really appreciate it, but we do need to jump right into this. So sure. uh, first let's go to sales factor apportionment, which has been mentioned a few times on this panel. Uh, could you explain that concept for us more fully? So basically, there are three problems with the way international tax works now. One is that it really distinguishes sharply between U.S. headquarters and foreign headquarter companies, and they tax as U.S. headquarters companies subject to the guilty, for example, and other rules in a way that foreign headquarters companies are not. And I'm not sure that distinction is that meaningful. The residence of a corporation, as we've seen from the inversion phenomenon that was mentioned by Senator Crapo, uh, suggests that this distinction is a little problematic. The other two also were mentioned already. One is the so-called arm's length standard, the treatment of every box within a multinational as a separate entity, dealing with every other box on arm's length standard uh, basis. And this is simply unrealistic in uh, today's economy, or I would say in any economy, multinationals don't behave like that. And the last one is what was also mentioned, the physical presence uh, idea that was really uh, a 20, early 20th century phenomenon, but doesn't exist anymore. So sales-based formula apportionment solves all two problems at once. The idea is basically to take the multinational as a group and then allocate its profits, net profits, to countries based on the percentage of sales that they make in that country. And the advantages of that is, first of all, this applies to all, all multinationals, so it doesn't matter whether you're American or foreign. Second of all, it applies regardless of you know, any transactions within the multinational. We talk about sales to third, um, you know, to outsiders. And finally, it ignores whether the multinational has a physical presence in the country or not, or whether it's digital or whether it's not digital. I mean, all of these are uh, lumped together. And the reason to emphasize sales, particularly in the formula, is because, you know, the traditional three-factor state formula, which has also been discussed in the EU, for example, uh, focuses on payroll, assets, and sales. But the problem with focusing on payroll and assets is that that drives jobs overseas because if we're going to tax based on that, then multinationals have an incentive to move their jobs to where they're not taxed, to countries with lower tax rates. Uh, sales, on the other hand, go with the uh, location of the consumer, and the consumer base, that is the large American market, is not going anywhere. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Now, um, also, the so we've heard about the OECD, and it has proposed a Pillar 1. And it's part of this grand negotiation. It, it includes pillar two, but I want to focus on pillar one because it bears a similarity to sales factor apportionment, but there are some differences. And I was wondering if you could explain the similarity and differences. So the big similarity is what was also mentioned already is the notion that a certain percentage of international's profits will be allocated to the market jurisdiction re without regard to the arms standard, without regard to the physical presence requirement. That's the similarity, and that is, I think, a very good thing. The problem is that, A, it hasn't been determined yet exactly how much. B, it hasn't been determined exactly what is the scope of it. That is, I think it's a mistake to focus just on digital businesses. That's a way of just penalizing the American companies. And more importantly, it this is just one amount. Then there's another amount uh, which may be allocated to market jurisdiction, but that depends on the arms length standard. It depends on the physical presence requirement. Essentially, you take the entire complexity of the existing regime and you add something on top of that instead of simplifying the regime and getting rid of some of these complexities that are really out of date. And that, I think, is the basic problem with the Pillar 1 as it is currently being negotiated. Right. And now, 
Uh, so we're, there is this concern that, um, you know, negotiations are happening, but, you know, we don't know what the result is going to be, what, whether or not it's going to be beneficial for the United States or even if other countries can accept it at all. Uh, now, if the U.S. wanted, could they implement the sales factor apportionment unilaterally or could a version of sales factor apportionment be incorporated to complement the current proposed tax plans at the national level? So first of all, one of the great things I think about sales factor apportionment is that it can be adopted unilaterally by any country, especially a large market country like the United States. And I think the U.S. would benefit significantly from adopting this simply because we constantly run a trade deficit, we import more than what we export, so that means that we will significantly gain revenue. One of the important points about doing things based on sales, and this is why most states now do it that way, is that you don't tax export, you tax imports, right? Um, so that's so we can do it unilaterally, but if we want to, for example, combine it with the current system, then I would say that we can keep the current system, including guilty and with all the reforms of guilty that we're talking about, that's more related to OECD pillar two, and we can apply sales factor apportionment to the foreign multinationals that sell into the United States and create a competitive disadvantage for uh, domestic American companies. And that can be a replacement, for example, for the beat regime, which has also been mentioned because the beat regime really has not been working every, any, very well. It has been raising very little revenue, and I think uh, it can be replaced with something like sales factor apportionment. Got it. Well, uh, I wanted, once again, uh, Ruben, uh, I have to say thank you for your time and your explanations. I appreciate it. Uh, I know that you uh, publish very often in tax notes. You've done a lot of papers. Uh, we hope to see more of your work in this space soon. Thank you very much. I appreciate you including me. Thanks. Thank you. Now, finally, it is my great pleasure to introduce the Chief Alignment Officer at Atlas Tool and Die Works and the Chairman of the Coalition for a Prosperous America, Zach Model. Mr. Model is no stranger to fighting for domestic businesses. Thank you, Zach, for joining us. David, it's great to be here today. What a great panel you've got going. Thank you. Now, let's jump into the reason that I invited you onto this panel, which is you have experience with other businesses competing with yours, but let's talk about why does a multinational competitor's tax rate affect your company? Sure, that, that's a great question. You know, we heard a little bit from G at, at a very basic level, you know, the government has a need to, to collect a certain amount of revenue and we can debate what the right amount is and, and such, but and what we're going to spend it on. But the government needs revenue. And, you know, it's very simple when one uh, group of individuals, corporations, whatever, isn't paying their fair share, isn't paying, uh, you know, what what is right. The rest of us bear the burden, right? And, and even even fair share. Again, we can debate what their fair share is, but when one group pays less, the rest of us have to make up for the difference. And so, you know, we we know that small companies like mine. We pay close to the statutory uh, corporate tax rate. We don't have subsidiaries. We don't have fleets of, of lawyers and accountants to really uh, figure out the system. And, you know, these multinational corporations, they've got tax advisors enabling U.S. corporate tax avoidance. And they set up, as we heard earlier, uh, these subsidiaries and tax haven countries with low populations, absurdly low tax rates. And, and they pretend it's really a game. They pretend that their inputs are more expensive and they belong in these jurisdictions and it just it's just a game to reduce their overall tax burden and make them more profitable but then the rest of us small family businesses mid-sized businesses and even individuals we make up the rest that, that these guys get out of paying and that's not right when they're some of the biggest most profitable companies in the world right and now We've also heard that right now, a lot of the focus that's been talked about on the campaign trail before, before the election and since the election, it's been focused on the American multinational companies who profit shift. Now, do you think this focus is sufficient? Well, you know, we heard a little bit again earlier, American multinationals, they might be dealt with by some of these guilty reforms. But the truth is, again, we heard this foreign corporations, they still have an advantage over the American companies. And, and I think we're going to see a resurgence of these inversions. You know, they, they uh, after the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, it did a little bit to slow the inversions. It kind of slowed to a trickle. But even in, in 2021, we're seeing these purely internal transactions between multinational corporations and their subsidiaries. And, and it's creating these accounting fictions. It's, it's profit shifting. That's what we call it. And, and these, these fictions, they cost U.S. jobs, 
They, they cost a manufacturing output and tax havens. They give special tax rates to these global companies in exchange for their jobs and their plants. These kind of agreements are usually contractually obligated. So, you know, I, I think that, uh, no, we, we, we haven't quite dealt with it. And, you know, we're seeing one third to one half of this profit shifting in the U.S. It's coming from multinational corporations with foreign parents. Some have a physical presence in the U.S. and many don't. So, so no, we, we've got to get a, a, a level playing field that's simple, that works for both foreign and multinational uh, corporations, for large corporations and small ones. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, now, the Coalition for a Prosperous America is on the record for being very interested in a sales factor apportionment solution, as Reuven described. Why do you think this idea would be helpful for your company and for uh, domestic companies overall? Well, you know, one of the most appealing things about sales factor apportionment is that it's not complicated. Um, and, and I think sometimes simple solutions are, are the best ones. A company knows where they sell their product and they know where they make their profit. Um, you know, and, and, and these clear inputs, it makes it very easy to apportion the U.S. corporate tax code on worldwide company income based upon the ratio of U.S. sales to worldwide users. If a company sells their widgets in the U.S., they should pay a fair portion of income tax on the profits they generated from those sales in the U.S., all these internal uh, accounting transfers between subsidiaries, you know, it's a game, which cup is it under? Uh, you know, so, so that a sale to a genuine customer outside the company is really all that matters. And so the internal profit shifting, it, it would be useless, it would be stupid, and it really lacks business rationale. It's just a game played to game the tax system. Right. And now we've also heard about the OECD. It has its own proposals and those proposals could impact the U.S. tax system. Uh, do you have any thoughts on those proposals? Yeah. Um, well, David, the, the OECD, I think, ju just like I like the simple system, they should be looking at a simpler system. Um, we, we, we heard from Ruben, you know, they're, they're kind of bolting on this other component to, to a very complex system already. And, and it really isn't making things better. Uh, you know, so I think if they're not willing to do that, you know, maybe, maybe the U.S. Might, might be ready to be a leader on this and go it alone and, and show them. I think they will eventually come to our party. You know, the rest of the world, it looks at American tax avoiders and, and, and these, these companies that avoid our taxes. It's a tax-based buffet. It's a free lunch for these people without reciprocity, these other countries. So, America, we should stop giving them the free meal. Let's strengthen our tax code. Let's hold foreign multinationals with access to our market accountable, just like we do small companies and just like we do individuals. Everybody pays their fair share. Let's make it that way. It's a simple system. I like that. I hope the OECD does hear that. But if not, let's show them the way. Let's lead the way with, with our tax system in America. Thank you. Thank you, Zach. And I appreciate on this. Uh, I look forward to the rest of the conference. But uh, once again, Zach, uh, Always a pleasure. Keep winning, David. You're doing great. All right. Thank you. And so uh, that concludes our tax panel. Uh, thank you, everyone, for attending. I very much appreciate any interest or questions that you may have. Uh, if you wish to talk to me further, I usually try to keep myself uh, in the uh, tax sessions. Uh, let's talk tax. And uh, the at this point, uh, I, we're almost out of time. The, uh, I appreciate the, uh, the input and I'll be happy to talk with anybody after the panel. So thank you very much.